yes, it was spatial. There was this huge basement in one of the great buildings, at, old buildings at Harvard, and it was inhabited by psychologists. And at one end were the students and the equipment that Skinner had developed for his behavioristic research. And at the other end, there was mostly physiological acoustics that people were working on the sense of hearing. And there was a man named Stevens who was measuring the subjective impressions of loudness. How loud does a sound seem? And he had concluded that it was a cube root law rather than a logarithmic law, which lots of people agreed with, but I haven't heard it for the last 20 years. And then in the middle there were these young people, George Miller and Joe Licklider and uh, Walter Rosenblith, who, all of whom uh, I had a lot to do with in later years. These are young assistant professors working on the interface between brain theory and and cybernetics and more modern symbol processing ideas. So it's a great opportunity. And uh, there was a kind of area in the middle where the graduate students of these three schools would have ferocious quarrels because they had completely different doctrines. And it was, it was like evangelist religious people trying to convince each other that their Bible was correct. About 1949, I started designing a learning machine, which was a randomly connected neural net with reinforcement. And it got built in the summer of 1951. And it was a huge machine, about the size of a grand piano, and it had 40 of these. This is a, this is a Heb synapse neuron, I think you might call it. I can't find the inputs and outputs on this thing. Oh yes, it's got a 11-pin plug at the bottom. And this is a kind of synapse. You put a pulse in, and it might come out, the output, with a certain probability. And this volume control knob here affects the probability. It goes from 0.1 to 0.99. And so you make a big machine out of these, and you put in a stimulus. And after a little while, a response comes out, having gone through various of these connections. And there was a bunch of ands and ors to connect them together. And then if you liked what it did, you pressed the reward button. And a motor is connected to this potentiometer. And if this tube is conducting, and you press the reward button, then it turns the the uh, knob up a little bit, and the probability is higher it'll do the same thing next time. And there's a extinguish button. If it has a response you don't like, and you press the extinguish button. So after a while, the thing does, for each stimulus, it tends to do what you approved of. Well, this was the first confocal scanning microscope which I built in about 1955 because at that time I was very anxious to find out how the nervous system worked <coughs> and there weren't any good photographs of brain connections in the cortex but uh, I figured out a way to look through a very thick optical slide instead of slicing it thin uh, as it you have to do for an electron microscope, you could take fairly thick slices, uh, a whole millimeter, and the way it worked is a very bright light on one side would focus a single very sharp point of light somewhere in the middle of the slide, and then a microscope on the other side is really just two microscopes back to back would measure the amount of light that got through, and then the slide was mechanically scanned. One magnet here would move the slide up and down about a millimeter, and this other magnet here would move the slide back and forth about a millimeter. So you could scan a square millimeter and get a resolution of about 4,000 lines per millimeter. So the thing had a resolution quite a bit better than the ordinary microscope. 
in order to get this thing to work, you needed a huge carbon arc to get enough light through the thing. Now you use lasers. And in order to see the picture, we had to have a, uh, an old radar tube with long persistence. And it would take a couple of minutes to scan the image and see a whole picture. And of course, now you'd use a computer. So uh, I'm afraid this gadget was about a generation too early to interest people. They didn't want to have all that equipment around. And about 1988, uh, the confocal scanning microscope became popular again because you could build a little one that would fit on the top of an ordinary microscope and connect it to your PC. The project to make a robot build with blocks came before most of the ideas in the Society of Mind. We decided that it would be interesting to see if we could get computers to do things out in the real world in the early 1960s. And so we had to do a lot of engineering to build interfaces between television cameras and the computer and mechanical hands. So we had to make a machine that would find some blocks and build something with them. And the programming problem was basically we had a table with a lot of objects. And we built an object. I guess a good example would be that. And then we sh confront the machine with this scene and say, build another one. Most of this research was very hard, long projects to do the simplest kind of thing that you'd think that any intelligent being would know how to do without even trying it. But then if you watch what a 18-month-old child does or a two-year-old child uh, any afternoon when it's playing with things, you, you see all sorts of you see the child doing this and moves it over and falls off the other way and it goes on for a long time. And if you if you slow down the video and watch the hundreds of experiments a kid will do every uh, few minutes, then when people talk about the attention span of a child, you realize that uh, they do things that very few adults would ever dream of working that hard on. This is a 12 degree of freedom manipulator that I built with basically an arm with three or four elbows so that uh, it can reach around things and get them even if there's an obstacle in the way. Uh, sometimes it was controlled by computer but in this case uh, I'm controlling it by a little miniature model of the hand that you can't see in this picture very well. This simulation of the global climate uses an irregular and dynamic mesh to focus effectively on changing weather patterns. In this application, the connectivity of the mesh actually changes from one step to the next. On the CM5, mesh data is distributed among the processing nodes. Exchange of data between mesh cells is done through the CM5 data network. Here, the messages are indicated by pulses of light. The network scales with the number of processors. Four 16-node network trees are connected to build a 64-node network. Four 64-node network trees are connected to build a 256-node network. That's my wife Gloria having dinner with the Emperor of Japan the week that we were in Japan to get the Japan Prize. Uh, 
I'm Hugh Downs, and I'm a television host, but my reason for being here is uh, twofold. I think a lifelong interest in things scientific and a firm and rewarding friendship with Marvin Minsky, our guest of honor. I want to welcome you all to MIT for the Society of Minds Symposium, which is in honor of the continuing research career of Marvin Minsky. This event is one component of a Festschrift in Marvin's honor. It's Festschrift, you probably know, is a German word meaning party writing, literally. It refers to an edited publication of works in honor of a distinguished colleague, mostly written by his or her students. Leave it to German academics to associate writing and partying. At this symposium today, we've asked a mix of Marvin's students and earliest colleagues to speak on a range of topics as diverse as Marvin's own interests. And later in the week, there will be other smaller events, and eventually there will be a book of articles and a hypertext of which these proceedings will be a part. Uh, what I'm trying to show you is that it's easy to make, or it should be easy, to make little theories about emotional phenomena. And people just don't know where to start. Uh, what's beauty? People think beauty is a terrible mystery. I have a different idea. Beauty is a quite a complicated phenomenon. When somebody looks at a painting, they go into, if it's really beautiful, or if they call it beautiful, something funny happens. And you say, well, what is it? They say, that is so great. That's perfect. So what do you mean? They, you know, it's just right. I can't find anything wrong with it. Well, bullshit, as Letvin, to quote Letvin. <laughs> uh, if they can't find anything wrong with it, what has happened? Some elevator has gone to the basement and it's turned off all your critics. Now, why does this painting make that happen? Well, maybe there's a woman so beautiful that you uh, have gotten into the sex thing. You won't admit it. Uh, maybe there's some geometric thing there that is so simple, like Frank Stella's square, that there's nothing to say. Well, there's always something to say. Like you'd say, isn't, isn't it stupid to pay $38,000 for a square? And that's, that's, that's what the person next to you is saying. <laughs> but I'm, I'm half serious. Uh, when somebody says some, do you think a sunset is really beautiful? That's weird. Clearly, it's got some releaser that has stopped you from criticizing the thing. Uh, probably because being a diurnal animal rather than a nocturnal animal, this is the time to stop thinking and look for a cave to hide in. Uh, now, that, that theory would be, what? Dawn's not so bad either. I was going to say that this, this theory would be contradicted by Dawn, except I've never seen one. <laughs> I've heard a lot about them, but uh, <laughs> I imagine if, in fact, every time I've seen a dawn, it was time to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, okay, any questions? <laughs> synthesizer. Uh, Ray Kurzweil was an MIT student a long time ago. In fact, he took my AI course once. But I have a feeling I've learned more from him than he did from me. And uh, he's done a lot of research on speech recognition and optical character recognition and music synthesis. So this is one of his uh, products. It's the one that Stevie Wonder did a lot with.
Everybody is very impressed with holograms, but uh, mirror beats a hologram hollow in, in all respects because it's full color and high resolution and makes real images and does it very whoops does them in real time. Oh, it's great. Uh, and the way a mirror works is unbelievably complicated. There's a wonderful book by uh, Dick Feynman called QED, and the central theme of the book is explaining how a mirror works, and in order to explain that, he uh, finally works the poor reader unsuspectingly into understanding a good deal about quantum electrodynamics. That's Gloria's heart. I don't know how to work it very well. The trouble is it doesn't seem to... I can't find the keyboard. <laughs> oh, one of my hobbies is designing remote manipulators. So This is a model of a possible remote manipulator where whatever you do with one of these arms is mirrored by the other one. Each joint does the same thing. And these could be a great distance apart because you just have to have a pipe here with the right wires or else you could have an electrical communication system. And the only thing that's special about these is that the wires don't actually connect to the joints, but they wind through the joints, through all these pulleys, and they're wired up with a sort of redundant code so that uh, if any two of the six wires break, the arm will still work perfectly, so that it's a kind of way of making mechanical things that that's immune to at least some kinds of uh, damage or errors. The trouble with the kind of robots that industrial people use <coughs> is that uh, there's a kind of engineering philosophy called KISS, keep it simple, stupid. And engineers in the space program and everywhere else are always trying to find the simplest way to do something. And uh, because they think that'll be more reliable because it has fewer parts. But in fact, in the long run, it's less reliable because each part matters too much. And so uh, that's another direction to go, which is not being practiced very much. But uh, I'd like to see more people understand that, uh, that keep it complicated, stupid, is the right thing to do in the computer age. How do you like our fish tank? <laughs> they look very chummy. Yes, they tend to school together rather well. I don't even know how it works, but I think there's four magnets in there moving around. And if all the fish get into the field of the same magnet, then they tend to do the same thing, which is pretty much like the behavior of real fish. When did that, when did you have that when the children were growing up? I got it the minute we moved into this house because it seemed to me that this was an ideal room for a trapeze. So all the kids on the block used to come in here and uh, learn different performances.
If you ask people, what are they? And they'll say, well, I'm me. Uh, what's that? Well, if, they're, if they've studied a philosophy course, maybe they'll say, well, I have a body and a mind. And I say, well, we know all about bodies, and a human body isn't very different from a guinea pig body anyway, so uh, nothing, nothing so great about that, except for uh, how it works. Uh, what about the mind? And then, how does your mind work? And then you get no theory at all, usually. Somebody says, well, inside there's a self, and it thinks, and it decides, and uh, if it doesn't know how to decide, it uses free will. And Well, those aren't theories. A theory is something that has some parts. It has to have some structures and things that can interact so that you can build up an explanation. You can't make an explanation unless you have parts and relations to, to relate the parts. So what are the common theories? Well, there's the self theory or the soul theory, which is basically the nothing theory. There's just somebody inside you that thinks, and inside that person there's another thing that thinks, and it's just one of those infinite regresses. Then there's an opposite theory, uh, the behaviorist theory. It just says, it says, a person is a huge bundle of rules, conditioned reflexes, schema, associations. There's a hundred synonyms for this idea, and it just says, that uh, there's a big filing cabinet in the brain. When a certain stimulus occurs, you look it up, and there's a rule there, and it says, if this happens, do that. Uh, so that's sort of the other extreme. And that's not a theory either. It has parts, but it doesn't have any relations. There's no structure in that library, and it can't answer any questions. But there's three or four other theories that have a lot more structure. And uh, my favorite ones are uh, the general idea proposed by Sigmund Freud in uh, around the turn of the century, uh, 1900, that century, and one proposed by Jean Piaget in the 1930s through the 1960s. He's the Swiss child psychologist. He studied children. Well, Freud sort of studied children, too, but he studied them through uh, things that adults said about their childhood. Not quite so trustworthy, maybe. And the third one is Nico Tinbergen, who was a great animal behavior observer, and he learned perhaps more than everyone else put together, well, he and Conrad Lorenz, about how to describe what animals do. So these three people have better theories. They have theories with parts. Well, the society of mind is a sort of fourth theory which says each of those theories is nice and they're each part of the story. Uh, what's the true story? The true story is dreadfully complicated. Probably the brain has 400 different pieces of machinery for doing these different things. And since we don't know what those are, we've got to start somewhere. And so I wrote this book to, as a sort of psychology fiction book. What could there be? Let's make a model of what a big mind might be like. And uh, I sort of threw out half of the ideas I had for this anyway, because they didn't work out very well. And so you're supposed to read the Society of Mind as though uh, somehow you got sent a hundred years from now and there was this big book on how the mind works. And this is what I hope it would look like. It doesn't matter if these particular theories are right, are right or wrong. The important thing is there has to be a book giving an image of what a good theory of the mind would look like, not what it is, because we don't know that yet. But as far as I can tell, there aren't any other books that say what it should be like. And it really has to have uh, 30 chapters with 10 sections talking about little uh, details of how the different parts of different agencies and agents interact and what are the problems that come up when you have so many systems and how could they be organized. So it would be nice to have the other half of the book and it would be nice to 
have the version 100 years from now, but uh, this is the best I can do now. <laughs>